chapter 19, verses 9 and 10, and then from chapter 25, verses 8 through 12. And you can see the pages that that is on, uh, on your screen, uh, where you can find it in your pew Bibles. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. You shall count off seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the period of seven weeks of years gives 49 years. Then you shall have the trumpet sounded loud. On the tenth day of the seventh month, on the Day of Atonement, you shall have the trumpet sounded loud throughout all your land, and you shall hallow the fiftieth year, and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, you shall return every one of you to your property and every one of you to your family. That fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you. You shall not sow or reap the aftergrowth or harvest the unpruned vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat only what the field itself produces. The Gospel of the Lord. Thank you. Oh. Author of life, we thank you for your word, and we ask that your spirit be with us this morning to transform us in heart, mind, and soul. We're now in the third week of our annual stewardship drive, and this year we're looking a little bit more directly at our relationship with money than we might normally do in church. In week one, we use the example of Judas, the chief priests, and the scribes in order to reflect on our own money stories, particularly where money might hold some sway over us. Last week, we considered the story of the rich young man to think about the way that our possessions can take possession of us. We didn't go quite so far as Jesus would like in letting go of all of our things, but we did resolve to let go of the things that we don't need in our lives. This week, the commandments for the year of Jubilee will invite us to reimagine our money story and the vision for our community and our world. Now, when we talked about the rich young man last week, we briefly looked at the example set by the early Christian community in Acts, how they sold all of their belongings and held all things in common distributing their resources from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. We also acknowledge that while this may not have ever actually happened in reality, it was, at the very least, the idealized vision that they had for themselves. It was the vision that they held of a world transformed. Here again this week, we are given a vision of a practice that was likely never actually followed through on, but that expressed an idealized vision of God's kingdom for God's people. Perhaps you've heard of the year of Jubilee before. It comes up in some of our hymns, for example, but maybe you don't really know what the Jubilee is all about. Maybe, at the very least, you know that it has something to do with a celebration, such as when the reign of Queen Elizabeth was celebrated with various jubilees to mark her 25th, 50th, 60th, and 70th years of rule. But the biblical jubilee is something much different from that. You see, as the ancient Hebrews were about to enter into the land that had been promised to them, the Lord set out a great many expectations for how they would live in that land. And among these expectations were instructions pertaining to the land itself. For six years, the Israelites were to work the land, but on the seventh, they were to let the land rest. Just as every week of days was to contain a Sabbath, so was every week of years. But after seven, seven Sabbath years had been marked, something even more radical was meant to occur. The 50th year was not just to be a chance for rest, but a chance to reset. 
The 50th year, the year of Jubilee, was to be hallowed by the release of any who were enslaved or indentured. Everyone was to return to their ancestral property and have their properties returned to them, and all debts were to be canceled. Basically, everything set back to the way it was 50 years before. You can understand why this practice never seems to have actually taken place, but it is worth noting what it represents. In theory, every 50 years, any inequity or injustice that had accrued among the Israelites was meant to be wiped clean. Everyone was to be returned to a state of equality. It's Equally worth noting that this practice is the culmination of a cycle of Sabbath. Rest and restoration were meant to be liturgical pillars of the people. Which brings me back to today. Last week, we thought about how easily we can become addicted to the things in our life, but there is an addiction that is so widespread among us that it's practically the civic religion of these United States, busyness. We love to be busy. Ask someone how they're doing, and they will likely tell you what has been keeping them busy lately. And even as we bemoan how busy we are, even as we tell ourselves that we need to take a break, we continue to overbook and overschedule ourselves. Does anyone else ever feel a little guilty about taking a day to rest and do nothing? I know that Sabbath can be a real struggle for me sometimes, and I imagine the same is true for many of you. Unfortunately, for most of us, the first victim of our busyness is our faith life. And I can include myself in that too. Before I started working in churches on the path to ordination, I could find a reason on far too many Sundays to get out of going to worship I was too tired. I'd done too much the week before. I needed to rest. How ironic that I should take God's own commandment to rest and twist it in order to get out of expressing my gratitude to God. Sure, maybe I was resting in body, but I was not resting in heart or spirit. I was casting off the chance to live into the kingdom of God, even if it was just for an hour each week so that I could continue to live in the kingdoms of this earth. But you're all here today, so let's say that we have overcome that spiritual hurdle in our lives, and we're intentional and disciplined about things like worship and Bible study. There are still other, more subtle temptations to busyness. Too often we demonstrate our devotion to busyness by laundering our busyness through our faith. The busier that we can be at the church, then the more holy that we must be, right? I know that for myself and definitely for some of you, that is a temptation. Several members of my family follow our social media posts and they often comment to me on how busy our church seems, that we are the busiest church that they know of. And there's a certain part of me that wants to take pride in that. But there's another part of me that can take a step back and ask the question as to whether our busyness is actually an extension of our ministry and witness, or whether we are adding programs to our calendar just for the sake of busyness. Now don't get me wrong. We just read the letter of James a few weeks ago, and I spent those several weeks telling you how important and necessary it is that our faith should include good works. And when it comes to good works, there can be no doubt that this congregation, all of you, do more than your fair share for the community. One of you recently said in a meeting that as far as service to the community goes, there is no one who is doing more than us. There's a lot of truth in that statement. And one of the questions that struggling churches have to ask themselves in the process of discerning whether there's a path to revitalization is if the community around you would notice if you closed your doors. 
I can't think of a church that I have served either as a layperson or as clergy that can say yes as clearly as all of you. Yes, the community would notice. But I don't know that that's always been the case for us. It's no secret that we've gone through some hard times and that our footprint in the community has been a little diminished in recent years. Now, shortly after I was appointed here, Carrie accidentally got locked out of the parsonage while I was here at the church doing something. And we were so new to the community that she didn't know exactly where the church was but she knew the general direction, and so she started walking down Rudderman to try and find it. Eventually, she came to the Wesco down at the Four Corners, and she walked inside to ask for directions. You would think from there it's pretty easy to tell somebody how to get to this church, but the person who was working there had no idea that there was another church in town other than the one that's just across the street from them. Thankfully, another customer knew who we were and was able to point her in our direction. So obviously, some folks still knew we were here, but it's not exactly a glowing endorsement of our community presence at that point in time that someone working a couple blocks away didn't even know we existed. Compare that to where we are today. Last week, Wendy was invited to a meeting at the school that included both parents and faculty, and her description of that conversation was that it basically included a half-hour-long infomercial for our church, as faculty and parents alike lauded all the ways that we have made ourselves available to the community through the school whether it was the use of our parking lot for parents and students or allowing the football team to come and use our building each week for their team dinners or opening up our sanctuary for baccalaureate or inviting high schoolers over for a free lunch on occasion or prompting an upcoming book study on how electronics and social media impact our youth, people knew who we were and they were happy to be in relationship with us. Those Lunches that we provide to the students, by the way, are making a difference. We hosted our first one of the year last week. Shout out to Jervis Fethke Insurance for being our sponsors of that event. And we had, by my estimate, about 130 kids come through our doors. And you might think, okay, great, but where are those kids now? Because there's not 130 kids here in the sanctuary with us, so where are they? Well, some of them might be at their own churches, and some of them might be home sleeping, but that's okay. Because as those kids came into our building, I would hear comments like, hey, they have a really cool place to hang out in here. You have to see it. Or, oh my gosh, I haven't been in here in a million years. Because time obviously flows different when you're young. (laughs) But the truth beneath and behind those comments is that as these kids get the chance to interact with us, they feel more at home here and they feel more like this is a space where they can be safe and find welcome. Giving them free pizza and pop was never going to translate into an immediate growth in our worship attendance. That's not the point of it. But what does happen is that we get a chance to start building relationships with these wonderful, kind, thoughtful children that will hopefully grow over time. And while I'm on the topic of building a community where people feel safe and welcome, let me give you another example of an overheard conversation from our Vacation Bible School this summer that was shared with me. One of the parents who was dropping off their child realized that they had walked into our, shirt, uh, into our church wearing a shirt with an LGBTQ affirming slogan on it. And that when they realized this, they said to one of their friends who was also there something along the lines of, oops, I don't know if this is appropriate to wear in a church. And the friend replied, no, this church would probably love it. So let's see where we're at. So far in this stewardship sermon where I've decried the sin of busyness, I haven't said anything about money, and I've just bragged about how successfully busy we've been. 
but fear not. There is a method to my madness. And to get us to the point that I am driving at, let me draw your attention to our mission statement. We are building a community for all who seek to know God and want to live in peace with one another. This is the vision of God's kingdom that we have set before us. It's perhaps not quite as grandiose as the vision of Jubilee, but it is the future that we imagine for our little corner of the world. It's a sort of miniature version of the mission of the United Methodist Church as a whole, which is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And friends, we are doing really well at the second part of those mission statements. Building a community for those that want to live in peace and transforming the world. Check and check. But we've got some work to do on the first part of those mission statements, the parts about God and Jesus. We can plan all the programs that we want. We can put together any number of social functions, feed the poor and clothe the naked. But unless we keep the why of it all in mind, then we're no different from any of the thousands of other charities or social clubs out there. Yes, we have a vision of the world, and that vision is filtered through the lens of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Redeemer. We do all that we do because of our faith in Him, and we need to do a better job of sharing that faith with others. In order to be good stewards of God's mission in the world, we have to tend to all the resources of our community. As St. Lawrence reminds us, the true treasures of the church are the people that make it up. It does us no good to keep scraping together enough money to make it another month if we neglect the most vital part of our ministry, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. So here's what I need you to do for me right now. I need you to grab a pencil that is hopefully in your pews there, and I need you to write down somewhere in your bulletin, on a piece of paper, whatever you've got. I need you to write down the name of someone that you are personally going to invite to church. And then, and here's the hard part, I need you to actually invite them. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a neighbor, whoever you decide upon, make it your homework to invite them to church. And if they don't commit to coming after the first invite, follow up with them. If they say no, I need you to add another name to your list and invite someone else. And for every no that you get, you need to add another name to your list. If any of you have ever worked in sales, you know that sales is just a numbers game. You're going to get more no's than yeses. But make enough asks, and eventually, your pitch finds a buyer. Evangelism is the same way. You've got to get out there, and you've got to be prepared to hear some no's before you hear a yes. And you can't let that stop you or deter you. The people of this community are at a point where they know about us, but it is time for them to get to know us. We have been planting seeds for a long time, and now it is the time for us to go out and get the harvest. Because I truly believe that the financial situation of this church does not reflect the reality of where we are at in our mission and our witness. I know that we can be on the verge of something big. But this is your community, and what it will be depends on what you make of it. Each and every one of you needs to have the mindset that you can be the difference between this church being resurrected to a new and brighter future, or this church slowly dwindling away, as so many other churches have. And now here is where I'm going to talk about the money side of that responsibility. This church can only do the missions that you make possible. 
I know some folks that are newer to being United Methodists have asked the question as to whether being a part of a denomination means that we get funding from the denomination. The answer is, unless things have gone very wrong somewhere, no. In fact, the funding flows the other way. Each and every one of our churches contributes to the district, the conference, the global church, and here in Muskegon, we also contribute to a collective Muskegon Methodist Ministries Fund. And if you've been around the Methodist Church for a while, you've probably asked a different question about this system. Why? Why do we have to send the money that all of you have offered to be used somewhere else? And again, the answer for that has to do with that big vision that we imagine for God's kingdom. We know that we are better together than we are apart, and we know that we can do greater things as a whole than we can do on our own. Those ministry shares or apportionment dollars that go toward the denomination allow us to have agencies like UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, so that whenever a disaster happens around the world, some of the first boots on the ground are United Methodists. And it's that funding that supports the hurricane relief program that you all just contributed to. It also allows us to do things like support Africa University, a college in Zimbabwe that uplifts hundreds of people a year from all across the African continent to return to their homelands as leaders and innovators. And I could go on and on with stories about what that money does on a global level, but maybe those stories aren't compelling to you because you want to know what your return on investment is from the denomination. I can tell you that I have benefited firsthand from our connectional system. When I was a student, I received grants and scholarships through our general board of higher education and ministry that made it possible for me to be here today as your pastor. When I was serving a church, one of those churches where something went very wrong, I was able to finish out my appointment year with them because of pastoral compensation from the conference. Here at Community, we used district grant money last year to help support our ASP trip. And just last month, MMM, the Muskegon Methodist Ministries, approved a grant to support some of the work that Carrie is doing at Coalition for Community Development. All of that work from the local level to the global level, is made entirely possible by you and your generosity. Again, I'm going to repeat something that one of you said recently. It was remarked upon that this community is really good about giving to things. Hurricane relief, angel trees, school supplies, etc. Put a direct ask in front of you and you step up to meet the need. Well, here's a direct ask. We need you to give to the Pastor Robert and Wendy Fund, which we also call our operational budget and our matching fund for the stewardship drive. I know that you don't get to see the benefits quite as immediately as when you give to a project, and I hate that I have to ask for you to put food on my table and a roof over my head, but that is the deal that I signed up for as a Methodist minister. I get to serve the Lord for a living in exchange for giving up some certainty and security. And Wendy and I both love being here and serving you, but neither of us can afford to do this work pro bono. So forgive me if that seems a little blunt, but these are the realities of ministry. I'm going to close by reiterating something. This is your community. You, each and every one of you, is responsible for it. I know that some of you are giving your all with your time, your money, your gifts, and your witness, and I thank you for that. And I think some of you know that you can do a little bit more with your time, your money, your gifts, or your witness. I'm not here to name names or call anyone out because Frankly, that's God's business. It's above my pay grade. But I want you to ask yourself a hypothetical. If the church had to close its doors tomorrow, and let me be clear, this is just a hypothetical. Nobody panic. 
But if this church had to close its doors, would you be in a position where you would say to yourself, I could have done more? I'm not asking if the person in the pew next to you could have done more. I'm asking if you could have done more. And if you find yourself saying, yes, you could, then I think you know that it's time for you to step up. Figure out what that something more is and get to it. We are going to build a community for all who seek to know God and live with peace in one another. We are going to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And we are going to do it by everyone stepping up and doing their part. You don't have to do everything, but you do have to do something. Amen. Please pray with me. Creator God, you have given us a vision of your kingdom, and you have set the work before us. Send your Spirit upon us so that we might each give of ourselves as we are able, so that we might come together as a body that is capable of doing great things, of spreading your good news, of making new disciples, of going deeper in our own discipleship, and of transforming the world. Let your will be done here in this place, in this very moment, just as it is in heaven. Amen.